question. The, the Christian answer, my answer, is that God is like Jesus. That Jesus is, as it says in Colossians, the Son is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. And so it's, if we want to know what God is like, we can look at Jesus and say, God is like Jesus. And in other ways, we can say, Jesus is like God. And so we can say that, that uh, Jesus shows the likeness of God, and that would be a uh, likeness not in like how tall God is or how much God might weigh, but the, the image of God in things like light and truth, um, like spirit and life and mystery and love and suffering and compassion. All of these things are ways that the image of God is seen in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus for us is like the divine one walking around on the earth. And, and sometimes this gives us some confusions because we think that um, he didn't quite touch the ground. You know, and he didn't really need to sleep, he just did it because it was the thing to do. And he knew everything and and you know, he walked on water to water to wine, and he was just like super magic man walking around, zap, 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 could like change the channel anytime he wanted to. So let's think about that a minute, because it's, a, it's possible that that's not the best way to look at how Jesus is on the earth, and actually how God is. Have you ever heard of a AAA, the American Automobile Association? Well, we also use it in the AAA theology, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, AAA God. And uh, this can lead to some complications. One of them is, how come if God is all-powerful, is there junk in the world? Why didn't God stop it? You know, the whole question of theodicy. Why do we have evil? Why do we have bad? Why do children die of cancer? Uh, and so what I want you to think about is uh, thinking of AAA instead of vertically, thinking about horizontally. What I mean is like this. If you ask um, uh, if, if God is all-knowing or if God is all-powerful, the traditional question is, can God make a rock so heavy that God can't pick it up? And, you know, so you get these little word games like that. But that's looking at it vertically. If you look at God being all-powerful as in all energy everywhere, horizontally, in other words, there's no place where God isn't. That's another way of looking at all. Instead of looking at all this way, super, super, duper, duper, duper power, which you can do, it's fine. But instead of looking at everywhere, 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 and everything power. Does that make sense? Same way for um, knowledge. Instead of like, knows everything, wins jeopardy every time. Instead, it's like, not that kind of knowledge, but it's like, in all knowing. In other words, the hairs on your head, a sparrow landing on the field. It's like all awareness, that there's nowhere that you can go that God isn't aware. Again, a presence everywhere. And the same way with loving. Like, can God love this much? How about this much? And in a sort of a vertical way, instead seeing, uh, again, that there is no place that you can go where the love of God is not there, that God doesn't love. There's no person you can see. There's no rock. There's no blade of grass that you can see that's not in God's love. It's a horizontal rather than a vertical way of looking at God's knowledge, and God's power, and God's love. And this is important because, um, because Jesus was not a know-it-all. We, we often think like, ah, Jesus, he had super divine knowledge. He knew what you were thinking. So you could go like, think up a number in your head. You know, I'm going to get him, I'm going to use, you know, pi, 3.14159. And then Jesus would go, you're thinking 3.14159, aren't you? You know, like, like he could do that, like super mind reader guy. And when you see it in the Bible, when he's like the Pharisees were whispering to themselves, and it says Jesus knew what they were thinking, we can take that as like, oh, he had super knowledge uh, from God, because God was like, in Jesus saying, those Pharisees, they're being in trouble. Look, you didn't have to be God to know that the Pharisees in this story were against them and were speaking trouble. It was just common sense in a way. It was awareness. It was ordinary human awareness. And so this, this is... Um, the idea that Jesus was fully human while still having this expression of the divine, this connection with the divine is still something we're trying to get a hold of. And part of being really human is being finite, not knowing everything. And there's a text that backs that up. 
In Mark 13, 32, they're asking Jesus about the end of the world. You know, you've got the stopwatch there, Jesus. You know when it's all coming down. And they say, when is it going to happen? And he says to them in Mark 13, 32, but as for that day or the exact time, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So there he says, there Jesus says it, I don't know. I want you to hear that again. Jesus says, I don't know. That is the experience of his life. And I want you to think about that because lots of times it's okay for you also to say, I don't know. And in fact, much of our living happens in the middle of a whole lot of I don't know what's going on or what to do or what's going to happen next. And I don't know what happened before either, but I still have to make these choices and live this life and do these things. And we think that that's different than Jesus, but maybe it was more like Jesus than, than we realized. Because we lifted him up so high it's like we've taken the skin right off him, and we've made him so he's like uh, not human. But um, here where he says, I don't know, I just want you to see the humanity of Jesus. And so in the picture that Linda put up, he understands us, he gets us. He gets us because he is us. He is like we are. And so we in some ways can be like him. And one of those ways that I want to build on is three times the way I'm looking at it that Jesus learned. He learned from women. When we think of Jesus as a know-it-all, we think Jesus never had to learn a thing. He was born and he could recite the alphabet. You know, he could do that. But we don't look at, I don't look at Jesus that way. I look at him instead of as the know-it-all I think of him as a fully aware, wonderful student, like the best student you could ever have. It's like you never had to say something to Jesus twice. It's like he got it. But it doesn't mean that he didn't learn and grow as a little boy and as a grown man. And so instead of Jesus modeling for us that we have to know it all and then tell other people the truth we have, he instead models for us this great humility to learn and learn and learn again. Imagine that. Because if you're a, not a know-it-all, then you need to do some learning. And so that's something else to think about. Because if Jesus was a learner, then you can be a learner too. You, you're not um, out of God's will or out of harmony with God. Union with God looks like being a good learner not just being a know-it-all. So go ahead and learn. And maybe you'll learn today when you hear these three stories. And by the way, you may, you may disagree with me. You might uh, think that, no, Jesus was just putting it on like he didn't know because he wanted to like test our faith or something. And if you believe that, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But I really like what this does uh, for my heart and my soul when I see the humanity of Jesus learning from women. And I picked out three, but I could have picked out a few more. The first time he learned um, that I'm going to mention is very fitting for Mother's Day because he learned from his mother. And uh, so I should tell you a, a personal story. It's a confession. Um, and that is, I was not the most motivated young man. I liked riding a bicycle and reading books and doing stuff like that. And it came around time, and I neglected to sign up for college. <laughs> so maybe I'd still be living in my parents' basement today <laughs> if I hadn't like I gotten a little nudge. Well, well it turns out um, that uh, my mother was on to my ways. She signed me up. <laughs> So my career started by my mother saying, you know, you're signed up for college, go. <laughs> and I went and I'm happy I did. But my mom had to get me kind of kicked out. I share this story because this is what happens to Jesus in the miracle of 
water to wine in Cana, Galilee. It goes like this. Jesus and his mother, and maybe some others, are going to this wedding in Cana, Galilee. This is in John chapter 2. And they run out of wine. And many of us have heard the sermon or read the Bible enough to know this story. And uh, then Jesus' mother uh, says to Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus says, and I might quote from John 2, verse 4, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not come. But it did come. Mary was right. Just like Jesus got the jump start from his mother. It was almost like Jesus was waiting for something else. But Mary, his mom, said, This is... This is baby right now, Jesus. Isn't that something? So he learned from his mother. Maybe you can even say that his mother bracketed his whole ministry because you see her there at his first miracle and you see her there at his death. And you see her there with the disciples in the resurrection. And you see her there in the upper room with the coming down of the Holy Spirit, according to Luke chapter 2. So mom, mom stayed with him throughout. But I want you to see that he learned from his mother that it was time to begin. The second one, the Syrophoenician woman. This one is from Mark 7. And this is when Jesus is, uh, they, they make sure to say that this is not a Jewish woman. She is not a, um, as far as we know, um, a God-fearing woman exactly. She might have had seven idols in her house. She might have worshipped at 20 different temples. God knows what. The, the, the writer, Mark, goes out of his way to say that she was not Jewish, that she was a foreign woman that meant she, she was not one of God's chosen people and did not um, uh, probably worship God exclusively. She might have worshipped them a little bit, but probably along with all what other deities were around in her point of view. And Jesus, uh, and but her daughter, but her daughter is sick. I think, I think she was demon possessed is the story. And she knows that this Jesus has something going on. And so she comes to Jesus and is like, you got to help me. And Jesus says in Mark 7 that it sounds kind of mean, but he's kind of like, I, I came to help my people, my family, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I didn't, I'm not, you know, this isn't, this is for us. Now, what does that mean? Well, one way is to say he was testing her. Um, and, uh, you know, because he, he knew what was in her and he wanted to see it come out. And that's the classical point of view, which is possible. But it's also possible that Jesus was a learner. And he really did, perhaps originally for a while, think that he was just supposed to take care of his people. And here comes this woman who throws a curveball at him because um, she is as not Jewish as they come. And, uh, and he says this to her. And, and he actually says that it was something that sounds cruel where he says, you, you feed your own children and then, you know, then you can take care of the rest if there's any leftovers. And, um, and the food is for my children. And this is what we hear, isn't it? When you, you want to have charity and you say, well, we can't help people in Ethiopia. There's people who are hungry right here in the United States, right? And, and then the question for the follow-up for me for that is, and how are you helping the people that are hungry right here in the United States? Because often they'll, they'll not be helping the people here either. But they'll be saying, but by God, we ought to be helping ours first before we help them. And they'll say, well, how, how are you helping ours? Okay, silence usually, right? So there you go. So help ours, but then what? Then what? What should we do? And her, what this Syrophoenician woman says to Jesus is, look, even the dogs get the table scraps. Even the dogs, you know. So she's like saying, you want to call me a Gentile dog? You want to say I'm outside? Fine. I need my daughter. I love my daughter. Save us. I'll take. And she ups him. You know, she bests him. He's like, wow. Woo, your faith. Oh, man, you're it. And, uh, and then he even goes on to 
will say, this woman, this woman who's not Jewish, who's didn't do the, say the right words, say the right prayers, from the right family, the kid in trouble, and <coughs> she's got it. So he learned. And this could be um, that he already knew and he was just testing her. Or it could be that, that Jesus continued to learn throughout his life and learned that, that his ministry indeed was more for outsiders even than he originally expected. Now, the, um, the next one is told in all four Gospels, but in different ways, is the washing of Jesus' feet. And this happens in Luke 7, 36 to 50. It's a kind of long, but uh, the, there's a couple of parts to share with you. And uh, it's at a Pharisee's house. And the Pharisees were not bad men. I'm closely related to them because I'm a, I care a lot about religion and about the right and wrong. And so I would be, you know, and I try to behave. So I would fit in like a, like a Pharisee. Some, some of us were good guys, some of us not, but we tended to be all full of ourselves and think we were better than other people. That's the, the problem. And so that was here too. And so in Luke, it goes like this. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, which again, I want you to know is a very generous thing to do. Because when you invite Jesus to dinner, he never comes by himself. <laughs> and so you better have a, you better have a fair amount of money because it's kind of like after a funeral when you say, everybody come to the restaurant. You wonder how big the bill's going to be. Um, and so... Um, he invited Jesus to dinner, and he knew that it was going to be a cost because, indeed, Jesus doesn't just come by himself. And the Pharisee, in fact, brought his friends and people there, too. So it was a big old, big old get-together. And uh, the Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, and Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she bought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood beside, behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, if this man really knew, if this man were really a prophet, he'd know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. And Jesus goes on to talk about those who are forgiven much and those who are forgiven little. But skipping ahead, he says to the Pharisee, he says, I came into your home and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss. They were reserving that. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not going to shake your hand until I know I can trust you. Or I don't want to give you the seal of approval until I know. So it was a testing dinner. I can tell you, as a pastor, maybe you've had these too. But I had these as a pastor. One church I served, not this church. There was a guy that would invite me for lunch from time to time. It was hell. <laughs> he was the guy that knew all the things that were wrong with me. And he would tell me, you should do this and you should do that. You know they say, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, you know, and love your enemies and all that. So I would go every time. I would come back with those things exhausting. Because you're kind of, you're put on the test. You know, you're really being, it's, you're, you're getting, you're, you're what's on the grill. Right? And you've, you've probably all had dinners like that, where, where you're not really comfortable because they didn't wash your feet, they didn't kiss you, you're not one of them, you're kind of being tested. Or as an example to like get your ears so they can tell you all the things that are wrong with you that you should do differently. And he would do that with me. And um, God bless them, may he rest in peace. It's a few years on. Um, but here, this is what happened to Jesus. He went to his house, and um, he um, he was treated with, shall we say, discretion. Let's not be showing off too much familial appreciation here, because we don't know about this guy. 
So he invited them to dinner, but not as comfortable your one of us dinner. Okay, so he so this is everybody knows this. And so you did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil for my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then that the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. But the thing is, uh, about Jesus being the Christ, um, that Christ is the term for the anointed one, the Messiah. And this is actually the only place, I think, in the New Testament where Jesus actually gets anointed by somebody. It's this woman. So the reason why I say Jesus learned from this is that um, it's possible that there was a dinner that came later. And uh, the basins might have been there, but nobody got up to wash feet, which was a normal custom to take care of things. And who gets up from dinner to wash the feet? Who follows in the footsteps of this woman in her humility that washed his feet? Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Did he learn this from her? Maybe, maybe. But he certainly got a very good example from her of servanthood, of humility, of generosity. And he wanted us to do the same. So, think of these three women. Think of some women in your own life. Who ever got you started like Mary got Jesus started? Who ever opened your eyes to see that the love of God is bigger than you thought it was? And who showed you humble, patient, persistent service? I'll bet you know a woman for each one of those roles. God bless them. The Christian life is your life here and now. You don't need to be a know-it-all. Neither was Jesus.